Well, we're in a series called Own It, and I'm so excited about this series and all that God has already begun to do in this series, and own it, own it, own it, overcoming excuses. A man recently went to his local gym, and he went there frustrated and mad, and he said, I'm here to cancel my membership. He said, when I signed up, I was given a brochure listing all kinds of benefits to me signing up to be a part of this gym. He said, in that brochure, you told me I would look better. I would feel better. I would have more energy. I would accomplish more in my life. In that brochure, it said I would get healthier. I would get stronger. But none of these things have happened. And the employee looked at the man and said, let me look up your records. And he pulled up the computer, looked up his records, and he said, excuse me, sir, but it says you've only been to the gym four times this past year. He said, it looked like you signed up, but you didn't show up. <laughs> Come on, some of you feel like this man with your relationship with God. When you began your relationship with God, you heard about all of the benefits. You heard about uh, this benefit that you could have of being a child of God. All the benefits in the word of God. You were excited and you were full of expectation about what God was going to do in your life because you were a, you're now a Christian. You said the prayer. You signed up in your heart to be a Christian, but you're not experiencing all the benefits that the Bible says that you can have as a child of God. Some of you today find yourself frustrated, frustrated with God. Some of you are mad at God. You're wondering if this Christianity, th Christianity thing is really real. Some of you are wondering if the promises of God are really true because they're sure not working for you. And the problem for a lot of people is they signed up, but they're not showing up. They're not doing the theme verse of this series that I taught you last Sunday. And church is so key. I know it was snow last Sunday. And if you missed last Sunday sermons, you have to, you have to go watch the sermon today. I'm serious, church. Get on YouTube and watch the message from last Sunday. Sunday. The theme verse for this series is found in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 12 where Paul writes to the church at Philippi and he says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out. Come on, every location shall work out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Paul says we need to work out what God is working in us. And we learned last week that we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And I want to say this to you because it's key, it's critical to see success in 2024. We have to overcome excuses and own our life. And today I want to talk to you about how you need to own your relationship with God. You can't just sign up to be a Christian and then not show up and expect your relationship with God to grow and to flourish. It's your responsibility to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Question, are you stuck spiritually because you're not working out your salvation with fear and trembling? Are you compromising in areas of your life because you're not working out your salvation? Are you lukewarm? Are you just going through the motions? Are you living in sin because you're not working out your salvation with fear and trembling? And I want us to look at a story in the Bible about a man who was stuck spiritually. He was lukewarm. He compromised. He was living in sin and was trying to cover up his sin. He wasn't owning his relationship with God. Today, if you have a Bible, open it to Psalms chapter 51. Psalms chapter number 51. Psalm 51 is a record or a journal entry of David's prayer to God after he had made the biggest mistake of his life. He had abused his power. He committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. He had her husband murdered. He tried to cover it all up. The man who was known as a man after God's own heart drifted away from God. 
He was living in sin. He was playing church games. He was making excuses. Instead of owning his relationship with God, he was trying to cover up his sin. Until one day, Nathan the prophet showed up. He confronts David about his sin. And from that moment, David was confronted with his sin. When that transpired, something shifted inside of him. And he began to own his relationship with God. And today, my hope and my prayer for you people's church is that something would shift inside of you as you hear God's word preached today and you'd begin to own your relationship with God. I want you to, I want to just show you this. I want to show you how David began to own his relationship with God because I want you to own your relationship with God. David signed up, and then he began to show up. Let me give you six ways to own your relationship with God. For all of my note takers, come on, get your pen, your paper ready, take some notes, get your phone ready, take some notes. For all of my non-note takers, get your pen ready and your paper ready and get your, get your phone ready. Take you some good notes today because you need to own your relationship with God. Number one is this, you have to own your sin. If you want to show up and not just sign up, you have to own your sin. After David was confronted with his sin, he finally began to own it. And in Psalm chapter number 51 and verse number 3 and 4, he says this to God, Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdicts and justified when you judge. David was owning his sin. Notice what he said. He said, my iniquity, my sin, my transgressions, my sin. He said, I sinned. David acknowledged and confessed his sin. David was done blaming people. He was done blaming circumstances for his sin. He said, I sinned. I did wrong. I blew it. And if you're going to own your sin, you have to acknowledge and confess your sin. You can't blame others. You can't make excuses. You can't justify it. You can't dismiss it. You can't ignore it. You can't hide it. You have to show up by owning your sin. You have to acknowledge your sin and confess your sin. I want you to listen to what David said in Psalm chapter 51 and verse number 9. He says, hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. David understood the importance of acknowledging and confessing his sin to God. Matter of fact, I want you to listen to what he said in Psalm chapter 32 and verse number 5. David said, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Church, if you want to own your relationship with God and not just sign up, but show up, you have to acknowledge and confess your sin to God. A famous verse says in 1 chapter, 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 9, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When we own confessing, God owns forgiving. Acknowledge and confess your sin to God. Number two is this. You have to own repenting before God repenting before God. David didn't just sign up for a relationship with God, but he showed up by repenting before God. I want you to notice this in Psalm chapter 51 and in verse number two. He said, wash away, wash away all of my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David didn't just want to continue in his sin. He was no longer justifying his sin. He was no longer making excuses. He wanted to change. He wanted his heart and his life to be different. He wanted a, a holy God to change him. And so he cried out in Psalm chapter 51 and verse 7, Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. 
Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hyssop, a plant. That's what hyssop is. It was a, it was a plant. And matter of fact, this plant was used throughout Scripture. In Exodus chapter number 12 and verse 22, it was used by the Israelites to put the lamb's blood on the doorpost so that the death angel would pass by their home. They would see you have the blood of the lamb over your life and, and the death angel will pass by. In Leviticus chapter number 14 and verse number 4 and verse number 6, this, this hyssop plant was used to cleanse defiled skin. And in Leviticus chapter 14, verse 49 through 52, it was used to cleanse mold in homes. And in Numbers chapter number 19 and verse number 6, it was used to make the water of cleansing that would be used to cleanse the people. And what David was saying to God, he was saying, God, take the hyssop that is used to cleanse the people, that's used to cleanse skin, that's used to cleanse the temple. And Lord, clean my life. Cleanse my life. Clean me up from the inside out. David wanted to be clean on the inside. Church, if you, know, if you want to show up and not just sign up, you have to repent of your sin. When you show up, you don't want to just be forgiven. You want to be changed. Is there anybody in the house that wants to not only be forgiven but wants to be changed by the power of God? Come on, every location, do you want to be changed by the power of God? We got to own, we got to own our relationship with God. Pastor, how do we own, how do I own my relationship with God? Number three is this, write this down, write this down. You have to own prayer. You have to own prayer. The entire chapter of Psalm 51 is David's prayer to God. David didn't allow his sin to stop him from praying. This is so key, church. David was filled with shame, with guilt, with fear, with anger, but he didn't just sign up. He showed up and he allowed all of those, he, those emotions he was dealing with because of his sin to drive him to pray to God. Church, the devil will try to use your sin to drive a wedge in between you and God. Matter of fact, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 says that the devil accuses us day and night. All day long. You know what that dirty, conniving, sneaking, evil, dirty, nasty devil does? He accuses you and I day and night. Always throwing accusations at us. Look at that sin. Look at you. Look at all that sin. Look at that stupid decision. You're a lousy Christian. Look at how you talk to people and treat people. Just look at you. You're just a worthless sinner. But don't you let the devil and those accusations put a wedge between you and God. No matter what you've done or where you are in life, you go to God in prayer and you keep going to God in prayer and you keep going to God in prayer. No matter how much you mess up, you keep going to God in prayer. Don't you let your mess ups and your mistakes drive you away from God. You have to own praying to God every day. God, I'm going to pray to you every single day. I'm going to seek God's face. You got to own coming to prayer at 6 a.m. Got to own. Now, come on. Some of you right now, own. Own your prayer life. Own seeking the face of God. Set that alarm for 515 in the morning. Glory to God. I can't get no amens in the house of God. I can't get no amens in the house of God today. Right? I'm going to own my prayer life and seek the face of God. I'm going to own praying first. What do you do? You pray first. Before you take on your day, you pray Come on, before you buy something, you pray. Before you discipline your children, you pray. Before you cuss out somebody, you pray first. And then you won't do what you was getting ready to do. Show up. Don't just sign up. Number four is this. Number four is this. I'm teaching you how to own your relationship with God from a man who is known as a man after God's own heart. Number four, you have to own your desperation for the presence of God. Your desperation for the presence of God. 
David said in Psalm chapter 51 and verse number 11, he says, God, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew how much he needed the presence of God. Can I tell you something about David? He had known the presence of God since he was a young boy. He knew it was the presence of God that helped him defeat the lion and the bear when he was taking care of his daddy's sheep and they came to attack the sheep and he defeated them. He knew it was the presence of God that helped him defeat this giant named Goliath. He knew it was God's presence that helped him escape King Saul when he was trying to kill David. He knew it was the presence of God that helped him become the king of Israel. David knew all of his successes came because God's presence was with him. And he knew God's presence. And he was desperate for, desperate for, for the presence of God. He knew how much he needed the presence of God. And church, when you start owning your relationship with God, you realize how much you need the presence of God. You become desperate for the presence of God. Is there anybody else like David that realizes you are where you are because God's been good to you and it's been his presence that's been on your life. Every blessing that you have in your life has come from God Almighty. It's his presence on your life. And so you want to confess your sin because you want his presence on your life. You want to repent of your sin because you want his presence in your life. You want to pray in the morning because you want his presence on your life. You don't want to lose the presence of God. And so you'll cry out like David, oh God, don't take your presence from me. May we show up like David by having a desperation for the presence of God. Number five is this. How do we own our relationship with God? You have to own worshiping God. Own worshiping God. Notice this right there in Psalm chapter 51. David says in verse 14, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. He had murdered. He had Bathsheba's husband killed. He said, oh Lord, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. Oh God, you who are my God, you're my God and Savior. He said, my tongue will sing, my my not anybody else's, my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord. He said, my, my mouth, not somebody else's, my mouth will declare your praise. I know David had to be weary from his sin. His heart was heavy. The guilt was strong. But this man knew the importance of worshiping God. He did not let his sin, his shame, his guilt detour him and to drive him away from praising God. No, in the middle of owning his sin, in the middle of repenting, in the middle of owning prayer and owning the presence of God, David knew he needed to own worshiping God. David knew the power of praise and worship. Can I tell you, it was David, who wrote these words in Psalm chapter 34 and verse number one, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. When you own worshiping God, you bless the Lord at all times. Somebody shout all times. Oh, come on. You didn't shout at every campus. Somebody shout all times. Come on, when you own worshiping God, you bless the Lord at all times, in good times and in bad times, in high moments and in low moments, when you did the right thing and when you did the wrong thing, when you were strong and when you were weak. Come on, when times are high and when times are low, you will bless the Lord at all times and his praise will continually be in your mouth when you feel like it and when you don't feel like it. You will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise will continually be in your mouth. Some of you need to start owning, worshiping God. 
Don't let your sin, don't let your mistakes, don't let your failures stop you from worshiping God. We don't worship because we're worthy. We worship because God is worthy. Come on, I said God is worthy. I said God is worthy to be worshiped in person. I don't care if you're an introvert or an extrovert. I said God is worthy to be praised. I don't care if you like to shout or don't like to shout. I said your God is worthy to be firm. Come on, he's worthy to be praised. Don't let your feelings stop you from worshiping God, God is worthy to be praised. Don't let your problems stop you from worshiping God because God is worthy to be praised. Don't let your mistakes stop you from worshiping God because worship isn't about how good you are. It's about how good God is. And because God is good, we worship God. We will own lifting our voice because God is worthy. We will own lifting our hands because God is worthy. I will own giving God praise because God is worthy. God is worthy good show up with worship show up with praise number six number six number six number six number six you have to own your spiritual growth one of the biggest lessons we learned from David is at the lowest point of his life he owned his spiritual growth even though he sinned big time against God this man still wanted to be more like God he wanted to please God. He wanted to obey God. He wanted to follow God. I want you to listen to the heartfelt cry of this man who was desperate for God. In Psalm chapter 51 and verse 10, he said, create in me a pure heart. Oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The cry of his heart was to have a pure and a steadfast heart. He wanted to be faithful to God. And that's why he wrote in Psalm chapter 51 and verse number 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David knew that joy comes from following God. And not only does joy come from following God, but peace comes from the Lord. And joy comes from the Lord. And hope comes from the Lord. And love comes from the Lord. And blessings come from the Lord. Let me say it to you like this. 2024 will be your best year ever if it's your best year spiritually. If you will follow and obey Jesus, it will be your best year ever. A ever, David cried out, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. He didn't want a stubborn heart. He didn't want to have a rebellious heart. David wanted a heart that followed after God because joy, peace, hope, love, and blessings come from God. Church, I want you to have a heart to follow and obey the Lord. Because I want 2024 to be your best year ever. And if you, church, for that to happen, for that to happen in your life, it has to be your best year spiritually. If you want it to be your best year ever, it has to be your best year spiritually. You have to follow and obey God. I shared this illustration last year, but I want to share it again. It, it, it just stands out to me about when I played high school football. I was a running back, and I was running a counter play. I would step one way and then come back, get the ball, and run this way. And the linebacker was killing me, was killing me. Every time I ran the play, I'd run, step, get the ball, run into the hole, and I was getting killed. And coach said, Cooper, Cooper, you're not running the play right, boy. He said, you got to wait. Listen, you got to wait on the guard. You're stepping and you're going too quick. The guard is pulling. And if you wait on the guard, the guard goes to the hole before you and blocks the linebacker. Shazam. Oh, my goodness. I waited just a little longer on that guard to pull. I followed him through that hole. And I began to score touchdown after touchdown because I began to run the play the way the coach designed it. And can I tell you, some of you are getting killed in your life because you aren't running God's play. Like you keep trying to do life on your own and you're getting clobbered. You're getting, you're getting wore out by the enemy and you've got to run God's play. And if you'll run God's play, you'll have the best year ever. And if you don't, can I tell you, the enemy will wear you out in 2024. I'm asking you for one year, would you run the spiritual play? For one year, would you run the spiritual play? Don't just sign up, show up. 
Here goes the spiritual play. Let me give it to you. Get your cameras out. Take a picture of this. I showed this to you last year. Some of you didn't do it, but this year you're going to do it. Amen. And some of you didn't run it. You didn't run it. You know you didn't run it. You remember it last year. You're like, hmm, yeah, he told us, but I, here I am again. Lord, it's me. Run the spiritual play. For one year, for one year, faithfully pray and read God's word. Just faith every day, faithfully, every day. If it's one verse a day, read God's word. Read God's word and pray every single day. There's 21 days of prayer. It's kicking it off for you. Here's a second one, worship in God's house faithfully. Faithfully, I want you to make a goal how many Sundays you're going to worship in God's house this year. Make a goal. Pastor, it's going to be 50 weeks this year. It's going to be 48 weeks this year. It's going to be, it's going to be 45 weeks. I'm making it a goal. And that's why we do the four-week challenge. They beat me to it. But, hey, the four-week challenge, that's why we do the four-week challenge. Why? To get you faithful to God's house. Would you attend four Sundays in a row? Some of you can't remember the last time you made it four Sundays in a row. Can I tell you, it'll be a game changer if you get in the habit of coming to church. And so next week's friends day, we're going to break the fast Sunday morning at 12 a.m. Some of you are going to stay up all day Saturday, all night, so you can eat some, eat some food at 12 a.m. Amen. But we're going to have donuts for you. We're going to have water baptisms next week. And then February 4th, a small group launch and free crumble cookies and big game Sunday. We're going to have, uh, we're gonna have the foot, uh, NFL and college football player with us and interviewing them and game day Sunday and, and favorite jersey you wear it and game day food and games in the lobby and celebration Sunday, the worship with the choir, New People's Church merch and baptisms. Why are we doing this? To get you committed to the house of God, to get you to invite your friends so they can come and get committed to the house of God because the scripture says when you get planted in God's house, you will flourish. You want it to be your best year ever. Ever get planted in God's house. Matter of fact, you can sign up for the four-week challenge. There's some invite cards in your seat with a QR code. You can sign up for the four-week challenge starting next Sunday. Four weeks in a row. Run the spiritual play for one year. Here's the next one. Give your life away by serving others. Give your life away by serving others. Would you go to Growth Track February 4th for four weeks? Go to Growth Track and then get on the dream team. I'm telling you, if you will serve others, the difference it will make in your life. It's all throughout the Bible. God calls us to be servants. It will make a world of difference in your life. Just try for one year. Just run the spiritual play for one year and watch how your life will be better. Here's the fourth one. Here's the fourth one. Grow closer to God and others by attending a small group faithfully. Get around other Christians. Do these four things consistently get in a small group watch how God changes your life and has set you up to have your best year ever some of you would you lead a small group for others to get involved in we have some small group training leading a small group is, is super easy matter of fact after the last service at your campus if you have an interest of being a small group leader this Sunday this Sunday after the last service or next Sunday after the last service you can go and get signed up at your campus and go to a training. Matter of fact, I believe it's in the growth track room at the campuses today. And also, go to the People's Church app. If, the, if this Sunday or next Sunday doesn't work for you, go to the People's Church app, click on small groups, and then you'll click on your campus that you go to, and then you can select a training date that works best for you. We want to help you lead a small group, whether it's a Bible study, a men's group, a women's group, a singles group, a, a, a financial group, a, a, a divorced group, a, 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 an addiction group, whatever kind of a group, a basketball group, you can take your interest and come and gather around the name of Jesus and use it to change people's lives and build relationships. Next Saturday, all of the small group leaders, all those interested in leading a small group, we're going to have a small group rally right after the prayer service at 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., so around 10, 10, 15 a.m., all the small group leaders at your campus we're going to fire you up, cast vision, get you ready for the small group launch. So that's next Saturday after the prayer service at your campus and small groups launch February the 4th. And would you get plugged into small groups? Get plugged in. And let me tell you about a special night, February the 7th. Mark your calendars, February 7th. That's a Wednesday. We're going to launch Brotherhood and Sisterhood together. The team told me, they told me, that they really want you to come out to brotherhood and sisterhood. So they're going to have free barbecue that night. Um, I just might join brotherhood and sisterhood. Glory to God. See them both that night. Get some barbecue and there will be free pizza. 
uh, for the kids and for the teenagers. Bring the whole family February the 7th for family night, and we're going to kick off brotherhood and sisterhood. Why? Because we want you to get in a small group because it'll make a huge difference in your life. Father, thanks for your word. I pray today that people would own their spiritual growth. They would own praying and reading their Bible every day. I pray they would own worshiping in God's house faithfully, Lord. They would be in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Students Wednesday after Wednesday after Wednesday. I pray they would own giving their life away by serving others faithfully. Lord, they would serve, they would serve, they would serve. Lord, they would own growing closer to you, God, by attending a small group. Lord, let people own confessing their sin and repenting and a desperation for your presence. Oh, God, I pray people would own their spiritual growth. In Jesus' name, as eyes are closed and heads are bowed and you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior today, you find yourself far away from God. You, you, you find yourself caught up in, in the world and in sin. And today, you need to confess your sin. You need to acknowledge that you've sinned and you've blown it and you're messed up, that you're not right with God. If that's you today, you're not right with, you know you're not right with God. You know you're not living for God. You know you need to confess your sin. You know you need your sins to be forgiven. You know you need to recommit your life to God. You know you need to commit your life to God. As I count to three, just shoot your hand up high. At every location, this is your moment. Own your relationship with God by acknowledging your sin and confessing your sin today. One two, three. Would you lift your hand high? Say, Pastor, that's me. I see hands going up all around this building. That's it. So awesome. Hands going up. Come on, Midwest City, Northwest. Come on, lift it high. Edmund, lift your hand high. Mabel Bassett, just lift your hand high online. Indianapolis, just click the raise your hand button right now or just write, that's me in the chat line. That's me. I'm going to ask every hand that's raised to pray this prayer with me. Confess it with your mouth. Believe it in your heart. And God's going to wash away your sins. Pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I turn from my sin. And I turn my life over to Jesus. I acknowledge, I acknowledge my sin. And I confess it to you. And I repent of my sin. And I thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. And from this day forward, I'm going to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm going to own my relationship with God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.